Hello, everybody. Sorry, I'm, that may have been loud. Is everybody having a good conference? I've really enjoyed this conference. It's really awesome to be back in Israel. I want to thank Adi and, all, and Michael and all the organizers for putting this together. It's been really great. So the opening keynote, Jason told you about 25 of his, the 25 best parts of C++. Um, it's sort of fitting that I'm just going to talk about one then. Um, I don't know if I think it's the best, but I think it will be the most impactful. Um, I think long term it might be the best thing that will happen to C++ since uh, the first C++ standard has been put out. Um, and that is modules, which is all that we're going to talk about today. So uh, first, a little bit about me. So this is a diagram of the C++ standards committee that somehow works its way into all of my talks. So I work at NVIDIA. I'm the head of the CUDA C++ core libraries team there, but uh, my real job is doing C++ committee stuff. So I am the chair of two subgroups on the committee, um, the library evolution incubator group, which is the SG18, the box at the bottom there. And I'm also the chair of the tooling study group. Um, which interestingly spends most of its time these days talking about modules. Um, and that is sort of the basis for this talk. We realized that modules was going to have a huge impact on the C++ ecosystem. So I wanted to get out there and, and socialize this feature and make sure that everybody knows what is coming so that you can prepare for it. All right, so as... I think I may have mentioned earlier, I think C++20 is going to have a huge impact on the language. It's going to be as big of an impact of C as C++11, maybe even larger. Um, there's a number of large language features that are going in, concepts, coroutines, improved context for support. Um, there's also a, sort of a redesign of the standard library with ranges. And there's also modules, which I'm going to argue is the most impactful feature in C++20. So what are modules? Uh, modules is a new compilation model for C++. And it's a new way to organize C++ projects. So uh, let's look at one example that we're not going to dive too deep into, but I just I didn't want to have too many slides without showing you some code. So here's a very simple project. I've got some header math.hpp that declares a function square. And then I've got a source file math.cpp, it includes that header file, and it defines the square function. Finally, I have a function main.cpp, which includes math.hpp, and uses this square function. It's pretty straightforward. All right, so this is what that looks like in the modules world. So instead of a header file, I have this math.ixx. This is what we call a module interface unit. The first thing in this math.ixx is this export module math. So I say, hey, I am a module interface unit. The type of, like, the name of the module that I am an interface unit for is math. And then I have my square function again, but this time I say export square function. Then I have this math.mxx file instead of a source file. And in this file, I have a similar declaration at the top saying, I am the, the file that defines the, the uh, math module. And then I have the definition of the square function. And finally, in main.cpp, I use this module by importing it. All right. So as I said, I think modules will have a greater impact than any other uh, C++ feature since standardization. Um, let me walk you through some examples to explain why. So C++11 introduced uh, a threading library, the thread header. So this changes how C++ code is written, right? Previously, you would use pthreads, or you would use your, uh, the Windows, thread, thread, bleh, Windows OS threads, or you'd use something like boost threads. And now you use the standard library's threads instead. So it changes how you write your code. Like, that's, that's an impact. It's not a huge impact, though. Well, how about lambdas? 
So lambdas, they change how your C++ code is written. But they have a larger impact, too, because they change the very syntax of the language. So they also change how C++ code is parsed, which you might think would just affect compilers, but it actually affects a lot of things. It affects your IDEs, things like syntax ha highlighting, static analysis, documentation parsing, et cetera. If anybody uses Doxygen in their, their um, project, they're probably familiar with how uh, poor Doxygen can be at parsing C++ 11 code until very recently. So what about modules? So modules, as we've seen, they change how C++ code is written. They change how C++ code is parsed, which, as I said, affects a bunch of tools. They change how C++ projects are compiled. This means they affect your build systems, your distributed build systems, your continuous integration systems. They affect how C++ projects are organized, like the very structure of your project, the types of files that you put C++ source into. That affects your packaging and distribution of your projects. And they change how C++ projects are consumed. This affects things like dependencies, both your downstream dependencies and your upstream dependencies, those things that you use and people who use you. They affect other languages that use C++. It's going to affect, obviously, tooling, any sort of tooling that needs to know how to consume a particular file in, in your project will be affected by modules. So again, I, I'll say I think modules will have a greater impact than any other feature added since C++ 98. Nothing else has affected the very compilation model and the way that we organize source code. All right, let's talk about today's compilation model. So what is the, the compilation model today? Like, How do we organize our C++ projects today? This might not be something that you've thought about a lot, because it's very in, innate in, in what we're doing, and it hasn't changed in 40 years. In fact, C++'s compilation model is C's compilation model. It's really, really, really old. So as I tend to do in all my talks now, I will now read to you from parts of the standard. So the text of the program is kept in units called source files in this international standard. This sentence is actually very, very critical because it, 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 it tells you what the international standard specifies, which is the text of a program. So a source file, together with all of its includes expanded, is called a translation unit. Most of you are probably familiar with this term. I will f refer to it in some of these slides by the abbreviation TU. So pre-C++ 20, we had one type of translation unit, what I will call non-modular units. So these were just like .cpp files. That's it. Now you might notice there's a lot of blank space on this slide. We're going to fill it in throughout this talk. So a program consists of one or more translation units that are linked together. And previously translated translation units can be preserved individually in object files or in libraries. So this model of compilation, we're going to call it textual inclusion. And we'll just go through a little example of how this works. So I've got some simple project where I have two source files, a.cpp and b.cpp, and I've got four headers. One header for each one of the source files. Then I have c.hpp, which is some header-only utilities. And then I have a header lib.hpp for some library that I'm using. That library is some translation unit that's been preserved in the library. So a.cpp includes a, b, and c.hpp. And b.cpp includes c.hpp, b.hpp, and lib.hpp. Note that the order of includes in b.cpp is slightly different than the order in a.cpp. All right, so the first step in compilation is to pre-process the source files, along with their headers, into translation units. So let's do that. So then we end up with this. We have textually included each one of the headers into these translation units. Next step 
we will compile the translation units into object files. Okay? Now we link together the object files that hold the translation units. And now we have some executable that's linked against this shared library. So there were three steps here. We pre-processed the source files into translation units. We compiled those translation units, and then we linked them. It's all very simple, easy to understand. Here is a little make file for this project. It has three rules. Two of these rules describe how to build the object files. So how do we build the object file for a.cpp? It just has one dependency. Very straightforward. Same for b.o. And then finally, we link together those two object files into the executable. All right. So this is a very simple model. That is one of its benefits. But there are some problems with it. Uh, mainly, headers are kind of terrible for a variety of reasons. So first of all, headers are slow to compile. Who here thinks that their C++ code does not compile fast enough? Yeah. So my, my projects, can like, if I build my, my the work code base on my laptop, it takes like 40 minutes, which is way too long for me. All right, so why is textual inclusion slow to compile? It's because of this. The, it, it's actually right in the name, textual inclusion. With, in that first step, that preprocessing step, you include the text of those headers into each one of your translation units. So each translation unit, each source file that uses a header has to parse and build the AST for that entire header unit. So this, this has some pros in that it's embarrassingly parallel. Like if I have seven source files that are using like three headers, I can compile each one of these source files independently. But the downside is those three header files are going to be compiled seven times. And when you get up to scale, that is very expensive. All right, second problem with headers, ODR violations. So what is the ODR? The ODR is one of the fundamental rules of C++. It's defined here, basic.def.odr. Uh, it says basically an entity in C++ uh, should not be defined more than once. But no diagnostic is required if it's been uh, defined in multiple translation units. This, this is called ill-formed, no diagnostic required. This is like compiler undefined behavior. Basically, it's saying your program's invalid, but we don't know how to diagnose it. So if you do this, mm -hmm, bad stuff happens. So let's look at an example of that bad stuff. So let's say that I've got some, some tree node class that usually just has two members, but if the macro debug is defined, I add some other members that give me some debug information. So if I include this header in one translation unit where I define this macro, I will get one definition of this type. And then if I include it in another translation unit that does not define this macro, I'll get a different definition. And then what happens if I try to pass an object of this type from that, that was created in a.cpp to b.cpp? Then my program's gonna blow up because these two translation units disagree about like the size and layout of this type. That's bad and your compiler doesn't really know how to diagnose this. All right, so headers are not encapsulated. So when you put something into a header, uh, unless it is you know, a private member of a class, typically there's very little you can do to prevent it from being used if you don't want it to be used. So for example, like if you have some function that's just like an implementation detail or some type that's just an implementation detail. If you need to expose it in your header, you are making it part of your interface. Now, you've probably seen or used in your code, code base something like a detail namespace or an implementation namespace or something horrific like this or ugly identifiers to try to keep people from using stuff that you're shipping in your headers. I've done this too. It doesn't stop my users from using these things. It's really quite awful. What we really need is a facility similar to access control for classes, but on the granularity of uh, you know, our, our, our units of code. All right, so cyclic dependencies. Headers let you write cyclic dependencies. Um, 
typically this comes up when you have like forward declarations. So like here I've got a.hpp, which builds b.hpp, has a forward declaration of y, and then has some struct x that has a pointer to y in it. And then in b.hpp, I include a, and uh, I've got a forward declaration of struct x, and then I've got a struct y that has a pointer to x. So this code works with headers. Like you can include either one of these headers, you'll get the definition of both of these things. But there is a cycle here. These two headers depend upon each other. Headers are also order dependent by nature of them being textually included into your program. So here I've got three, I've got two headers and one, one uh, source file. The first header a.hpp, I declare some struct. And in the second header b.hpp, I have a function that takes that struct but doesn't forward declare it. And in c.cpp, I just happen to include a before b. So I don't get, I don't run into any problems yet because I just happen to have included the thing that b needed before I used it. And if everywhere that I include a and b, I always include them in this order, everything's fine. But if I include them in a different order, then I'm going to get an error. And I'm sure most of us have run into issues with this in our code bases at some point, where you were missing an include in some particular header. All right, so headers are terrible. I think we can all agree to that. Yes? Yeah? All right, good. OK, so now let's talk about using modules. So this talk basically breaks down into two parts. The import part of the talk, where we talk about how we use and consume modules, and the export part of the talk, where we talk about how we write modules. So we will start with import. So import is a new keyword in C++20. And it is, you can think of it as like a replacement for include. So instead of including some header file, you import a module by name. So now let's take a look at the compilation model um, for modules. I think that's the easiest way to sort of give you an, an overview to how it works, because it's not as straightforward as the textual inclusion model. So when importing, the compiler finds the relevant module interface unit, which we're going to call .ixx's in this presentation. And that .ixx, as we saw with a few examples earlier, describes which entities are exported from the module. So the, the module interface unit is sort of similar to a C++ header, the sort of the replacement for headers. But unlike a header, a module interface unit is a separate translation unit, not text that is included into each TU. So when you import a module, you are not textually including something. There, you, you, are, you have another translation unit that's going to be compiled, and you are using entities from that other translation unit. Module interface units need to be pre-compiled into a non-textual representation that is fast for compilers to look up in and use. We call these compiled module interfaces, or CMIs. So this is a new step of compilation. You need to pre-compile your .ixx's into CMIs. So let's do that now. All right, so now we have CMIs for each one of our module interface units. So now we do pre-processing as usual, but we're not actually including anything into these files, so we don't dump up you know, the text of a bunch of headers in here. All right, so next, so after we've pre-processed, now we don't need the, uh, the actual uh, module interface unit source files. We can get rid of those. We can just work with the CMIs. And now we need to compile our two translation units, and we also might need to compile our CMIs. Um, this will depend on your compiler. Some compilers, you may need to compile your CMIs to object files um, because there may be metadata, such as debug information, that you want to have preserved through to the link. Um, on other compilers, you might not need to compile your CMIs to object files. For right now, let's just assume that we're going to be compiling our CMIs to object files. This is the, the thing that you should do with Clang today, and that's the implementation that I've mostly been working with. All right, so we, we've had here, we had CMIs, and we had .mxx's, module implementation units. We'll explain more about what those are later. And these are all, those are just source files. 
and we're going to compile all of these to object files. So now we have dot i dot o's for the, uh, the object files for the interface units, and we have dot m dot o's for the object files for the implementation units. All right, and finally, now we just link all these things together, and we get our executable, just as before. A few more steps, but we get the same product in the end. So the, the, the key difference here is that we have a new step. OK, cool. Um, we have a new step in the compilation process, which is this pre-compilation of module interface units to compiled module interfaces. All right, now we're going to look at the, an example of what a make file would look like for this. Unfortunately, it doesn't fit on one screen. OK, so first, this is what it would look like to compile the uh, CMIs from the module interface units. So if, like Clang has a flag pre-compile. It's similar to the dash C flag that you would use for taking source units to object files. But here, we're outputting CMIs, which is not, it's not a binary representation necessarily, but it's some efficient, non-textual representation of your uh, module interface unit. So once we have these .CMIs, we need to compile them to .Os. So here are the rules for that. And then we need to compile our uh, module implementation units, the a.mxx and the b.mxx. And these depend on the CMIs, because those implementation units imported some of those modules. So they need the CMIs to figure out what stuff was in those modules. And then finally, we have the link here, which has a whole bunch of things. It has the object files from the implementation units, and it has the object files from the interface units. All right, yes, I know, this is not as straightforward as you might like. Yeah, question? I'm sorry, can you repeat the uh, question? The, the question is, um, are, are the, de the dependencies are duplicated in the text file and the make file? Yes. I have chosen to do it this way. This is what we, you would call it um, uh, the, the explicit model of how to deal with modules, where you explicitly encode your modular dependencies into your make file system. So the make file we saw earlier for the textual inclusion did not encode any dependency information for the header files into the make file, because typically you don't do that explicitly today. You might use like a compiler's dash MMD mode to do that, but you normally don't like explicitly encode that. Um, that might not be a world that we live in any longer. We may now live in a world where you want to explicitly encode your, your dependencies like this, all of your dependencies like this. All right, so yeah, another question? Yes, we will talk about that later. Um, there are pros and cons to that, but we're, we're going to talk about that later. The question is, um, uh, will compilers add some sort of dependency scanning mode for modules? And yes, they will. Um, that's been something that's already been done for uh, GCC, I believe. I don't know about Clang. Um, and some build systems like CMake are already working on integrating in those dependency scanners into their build system. Um, but we will talk about that later. Um, maybe. Okay, so let's compare the, the uh, uh, algorithmic build performance of textual inclusion to modular inclusion. So as we said earlier with textual inclusion, uh, the pro is that it's embarrassingly parallel. We can compile all of these uh, source files uh, independently of each other, but we are compiling the headers multiple times. With modular inclusion, we pre-compile each one of the interface units just once. However, things are no longer embarrassingly parallel because like, we, we need to, to do this explicit pre-compilation step and we have multiple consumers of each one of these headers. We only want to do that pre-compilation once, which now means that these source files depend on something happening. And so you can no longer just do these all independently or you lose the the uh, build performance benefits of modules. All right, so let's go back to this table. 
of the types of translation units. So we have added two new types, module interface units, which are units that start with this export module module name. And I'm calling them in this talk, talk dot .ixxs. And their build artifact are CMIs and potentially .os. There's going to be exactly one, uh, uh, or sorry, there will be at least one module interface unit per um, uh, module. And the module implementation unit, which we saw one example of, it's just, it's similar. It has a module declaration at the top, it's .mxx. gets compiled to a .o. It's analogous to a source unit. And you will have at most one per module. Yeah. Ah, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna get to that later. Um, that's a complicated question. Um, the answer is right now they are not tied to files. Yeah. Yes. So um, the term of art for CMIs has been BMIs, binary module interface. Um, I have been advised by colleagues that we don't want to use the term BMI, binary module interface, because it suggests that these artifacts are something that have a binary interface and can be redistributed. And that is not the case, at least for the majority of implementations that we're aware of. So I am calling them CMIs in this talk, even though it is a term that will be foreign to anybody who knows anything about modules, because I want to emphasize that these are not artifacts which you should distribute with your project. They are a cache of your module interface unit and it will be very difficult for you to redistribute them in a way that people will be able to use them. Yeah. We will, we will get there. Yes. Uh, one more question, then we're going to move on. Um, what do you mean? Yes, so um, you can write, you can write uh, the replacement for sort of header-only libraries, um, which contained templates, um, would be module interface unit only libraries, which contain templates. You can't, you can't put the definition of a template into a module implementation unit. It needs to be in the module interface unit, I believe. I'm actually not sure about that, so um, I will have to look that up later. I'm not sure about that. Um, yeah, all right, we're gonna move on. Okay, so we looked at this example earlier. Um, the next example sort of gets to what you were talking about, which is what do you do when you have like a header-only library? So like this map.hpp here where I define a template in it. Well, you can just replace it with a module interface unit only library. So you do not need to have a module implementation unit. You can just have a module interface unit like this map.ixx here. All right, so um, I lied earlier when I said, when I showed you that form of import because there's actually three forms of import. Um, you can, this first form of import is sort of the regular import uh, where you import a first class module. The second two imp uh, import synthesized header units. So that's what import with the braces or import with the quotes. Um, so this is part of the transition path for modules. So Importing a header unit says, hey, um, uh, I want you to go find this header and go and, and treat it as if it's a module that, that just exports everything in it and package it up into this um, synthesized CMI and then import it into um, my translation unit with the semantics of import. Um, so for this to work, the header that you are trying to import must be importable. Um, what is importable in C++ 20? Most C++ standard library headers, with the, with the yeah, exception of C standard library headers like C um, assert, C std def, um, C std io, et cetera. Um, they are, the rest of them, the, the pure C++ standard library headers are all required to be importable. Um, some of your system headers are probably going to be importable. This slide used to say most until a colleague who I emailed these slides to said, that was surprising to me. 
Um, but I suspect that some amount of your system headers, in particular, your compiler's implementation headers will probably be modularized. And compilers will probably give you some way to proclaim that a header is importable. Um, so anybody who's familiar with, with Clang's pre-C++ modules, modules is probably familiar with how you do this with Clang, where you set up a module map that describes, hey, um, this module is formed by, by including these headers. Most compilers will probably have some mechanism like that. Okay, so um, let's talk about why some headers aren't importable. So assert is a good example of this. Assert.h um, is a C library header that does not have any include guards, and the definition of the assert macro um, depends on whether or not in debug is defined. And the purpose of this is to allow you to include assert into different parts of your program, some parts that want asserts on, some parts that don't want asserts on. And so because it doesn't have an include guard and because it, it's, its behavior, part of the contract of its behavior depends on this macro, it is inherently textual. This is not a header in its current form that would ever make sense to turn into a module. Um, likewise, headers that uh, define macros, like uh, C std def, um, which defines uh, null and offset of as macros, um, these are not uh, uh, modular headers because they define macros and macros um, are, modules are sandboxed, macros don't go in or out of modules. Uh, so this is why the C library headers are currently, are not required to be importable. Yeah? Um, the question was, are macros going into legacy imports? Uh, you might be right. Um, it might be that they can go out from legacy imports, but they can't go in. Yeah, I think that's right. So. This one might work, actually. Yeah. Um, so there's a slide on this later, but um, macros that are defined globally, like on the command line, modules do see those. So that, that's how you'd have to pass in flags that distinguish between different architectures, et cetera. And thing, like macros that are defined by your compiler globally throughout the program, um, uh, those will be seen by modules. The, the, whole, the whole promise of modules here was that modules was going to uh, make it a lot harder to violate the ODR. Um, but the only way to make that happen was to make it a lot harder to violate the ODR. And macros are the number one violator of the ODR. So, Yes, there are going to be places where this might be painful or it might feel like it's handicapping you, but the benefit is you will not have to worry about ODR violations in a lot of places. Uh, all right, one more, then we're moving on. Do modules affect namespaces? Um, there, is, there is no direct relation between modules and namespaces. Um, yeah, all right. So there's this um, nifty rule in the standard that says, basically, if you have an include of a header that is known to be an importable header, the compiler may replace that include with an import. So for example, if you write this code in C++20, you include vector and you include IO streams, it may be turned into this code, importing, IO importing vector and importing IO streams. So basically, if you're using the standard library, out of the box, you will be using modules in C++20. I think this slide may be out of place. No, no, it doesn't seem like it is. Um, so now we've talked about four different types of translation units, non-modular units, or sort of traditional source files, header units, which are synthesized when you attempt to import them, module interface units, and module implementation units. All right, that was the import part of the talk. Now we're going to get to the export part of the talk. We're going to talk about how you write modules. So first of all, how are modules named? So module names are dot separated identifiers. So it can be any, anything that could be a legal identifier and then a dot and then anything that could be a legal identifier repeated, et cetera. So like you could do like boost.spirit, import CTRE, blast.level1. Um, the dots in module names have no semantic meaning whatsoever. They're just there as useful separators. So use them as you will. Um, best practices for these will develop with time, I'm sure. The basic idea is that perhaps you would use these 
um, sort of for sub subcomponents of your libraries. All right, so let's talk more about writing modules. So let's talk about a module uh, unit. So, so module units are any translation unit that, the, that, that contain a module declaration. So we've already seen what a module declaration is. Um, it's just a declaration that says module and then a name, and it optionally can have export in front of it. And if it has export in front of it, it is a module interface unit. And if it doesn't, it is a module implementation unit. Uh, modules, you can only have one module declaration per translation unit. And this is the same for module interface units. Um, and in a module unit, so the module declaration must be the first thing in the module unit. There's a caveat to that that we're going to get to later. But that, it must be the first statement. Like you can put comments in front of it, but you can't put anything else. And then there's this other rule that in a module unit, all module import declaration, de declarations have to be at the top of the file right after the module declaration. So I'm not going to read this to you because this is kind of confusing. I will show you this diagram. Like this is the structure of module units. You have a module declaration. It can optionally have an export in front of it. Then you have a series of import statements. Then you have the rest of your code. Now, this structure is only for module units. Non-modular units can import modules. They can't define them, but they can import them. And they can put the imports wherever they want. Now, one of the reasons that we have this structure is that by putting all the imports at the top of the module unit, it makes it easier for us to scan for dependencies quickly. If they're just you know, anywhere in the code, that means that we have to do more scanning. This way, we can just go and scan until we hit something that's not an import. All right, so now let's talk about export declarations. So there's two forms. Basically, basically it's export followed by any type of declaration, or you can have an, a block export. Um, so you can export functions. You can export structures. You can export variables. You can use a block export to export all those things. You can export templates. Note that the export needs to go before the template. I know it, 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 you're going to have the urge to put it before the return type, because that's what you do with functions. But that's not where it belongs. It belongs before the template keyword. You can export template specializations. And I don't exactly remember exactly how it works if you, um, ha if you export the primary template and you don't export the specializations. Um, my guess is that then you don't see the specializations outside of that module unit. You can export the members of a namespace block. So by that, I mean this export namespace syntax. It's important that I set it that way, because saying export namespace does not mean that you're exporting everything in that namespace. You're exporting just the things that were declared in that namespace block. So like here, we have export namespace foo with struct a, and then we have another namespace block later that is struct B, only foo A is exported here. You can export type defs. You can export um, using declarations. You can also export using directives, which will be very useful, as we'll get into later. So using directives, for those who aren't familiar, it's just a statement that says using some name. And it brings that name into scope, into the current scope, even if that name is already in scope. So this is useful if you have some existing code that you want to modularize. Because what you can do is you can include that code into your module. And then you can export um, using the things that you want to export from that code. And then you can do this, export, import. I know this is, uh, this is, this is what happens in C++. Um, so what export, import means is it means re-export this thing. So I'm going to use this thing in this, in this module unit, but I also want to make it available to the people who import my module unit. So for example, let's say I have two module interface units, square.ixx and add.ixx. Each of them uh, defines a module and uh, exports one thing from that module. And then I have this math.ixx. And all it does is it export imports or re-exports those other two modules. So now when I import math, I will, have, I will see both of these two entities from these other modules. All right, so what happens if I export something that returns a type that's not um, exported? 
or return or somehow uses some entity that's in the module but has not been exported. Well, then that thing gets sort of implicitly exported, but that's not really a good term for it. Basically, you can use, like, this is fine, completely valid code. Um, the way it works is that S is reachable in this, this code here that uses it in main.cpp, but it's not visible. So you can, you can call foo and you can get back a value of type S, but you've got to use auto there. You can access the members of S, but you can't actually spell S because it is reachable but not visible. You can't name the type. That's, yes, you can. So yes, you may cheat. Um, you can't actually spell the type here. So these two concepts are sort of crucial to understanding modules. So there's the notion of visibility, which means that something is in scope and can be named. And there's the notion of reachability. So something that's reachable but not visible is something that is like not exported, that, that, that is, is there, but you can't spell it out. You might actually be able to get to it, but you can't spell it. All right, so like in this example here, S is reachable, foo is reachable and visible. All right, so modules enable true encapsulation that's not possible with headers. So let's say that I've got some project where I've got two headers, a.hpp and b.hpp, and they both define something with the name id. One of them defines a function with the name id. One of them defines a uh, struct with the name id. So if I include both of these, I'm going to run into a problem because now I've got declarations of two different things that are, that are of different types of entities. One's a function, one's a, one's a type. Um, and and this, these aren't part of my interface. These are just implementation details. Like, I don't, I don't care about them. So as I alluded to earlier, you end up doing stuff like this or, or this in your code to try to protect your implementation details from one, being used by people who shouldn't be using them, and two, from clashing with uh, uh, other names of other things. So with modules, you don't need to do this because if you don't export something, it is not visible in other units. So like here, it's perfectly fine for me to have ID defined in a.ixx a and b.ixx and to import both of them. All right, so no more need for detail or impl namespaces, no more uglifying identifiers. Um, and even if one of them exports that name, if the other one doesn't export it, it's, it's fine. Um, y yes, but, it, but that's true even if it's not a static. If you have something in a module that, that's, that's, not, that's uh, not exported, then it's only visible with that module. That's actually a perfect segue into the next thing, which is this beautiful part of the standard which defines what linkage is. Linkage is a notoriously sort of confusing part of C++. But the, the key thing to note from here before we go to the table that makes this make sense is that we have a new form of linkage which is called module linkage. Previously we just had external linkage and internal linkage and then things that had no linkage. But now we have module linkage. So this is what, like, this is how linkage works now in C++20. So a lot of things that used to have um, external linkage now have module linkage in a module unit. So things that like just like regular declarations of things at, glo at global scope in a module have this module linkage, which means that they're visible from within this module. Um, things that are external or export have external linkage and are visible from other translation units. And internal linkage is the same as it's always been, and no things with no linkage is the same as it's always been. So we have this new type of linkage in C++20. All right, so modules are encapsulated. They're also sandboxed. So um, for, for non-header uh, unit imports, uh, uh, at least, um, macros can't leak in and macros can't leak out. Um, so, let's see. so this example here, I have, um, that, that first one should be a.hpp, not a.cpp. I have one header that defines a struct foo, and then I have another header b that 
uses that struct foo in, as one of the arguments to one of its functions, but doesn't include a.hpp. We saw an example like this earlier, where this happens to work if you include a before you include b. But in a modular world, if you have this same structure, where I've got an a.ixx that defines the struct foo and exports it, and then I have a b.ixx that uses a foo in the interface of one of its functions, even if I import a before importing b, I will have an error here because the imports are, are fully sandboxed. In fact, I, I, at least at one point, the way that Clang's modules implementation worked was like it spun up another process and like handled your module interface unit in that other process so that it would be fully and truly sandboxed. Nothing leaks into it. No macros, it doesn't see any, it doesn't see any declarations that it does not explicitly import. So let's look at some more examples of this. Let's say that I've got an a.ixx module that uh, has some struct foo, and before I import it, I define foo to be bar, and then I import it, and then I undefine foo afterwards. That macro is not seen in the imported module. No trickery here. Likewise, if I have some module that has an if defined debug, if def, where I'm trying to do something depending on whether I have a debug flag enabled, if I define debug programmatically before I import it, the definition of debug isn't going to be seen by the imported module. Um, so this, this has its pros and cons. Um, for example, if you're trying to um, define a, a configuration macro for your standard library, if you do an import, it won't see this um, pound define. But if you recall this rule from earlier, which allows compilers to take includes of importable headers and turn them into imports. That means that if you write this, that include a vector in C++20 will not see that definition of that macro. That might be a little surprising. I was not thrilled with this particular, this particular angle, but I am willing to live with it because this moves us away from writing copious ODR violations. So if the only way that macros can get into our uh, modules is by being defined globally for the build of the entire translation unit, it makes it a lot harder for us to write ODR violations. And that is a good thing. Yes, yes. All right, so some other examples. Um, Actually, those should be in ports there. We're going to move over those because those are wrong. So how do we deal with non-modular headers? So macros defined on the command line will be seen. So you can, you can like, if you pass in a macro through your compiler's options globally, it will be seen by your modules. Um, uh, we should, OK, so, so imagining that, imagine that we want to include in um, something like unistood.h into um, one of our modules. Um, so if we just include it, and then this is a non-modular header, if we just include it, um, this will be problematic because modules own all of the declarations in the module. So if we include unistood.h into our module, then we own all of the declarations in unistood.h, which is probably not something that we should do. Thus, we have this thing called the global module fragment, which is allowed to go right before your module declaration. And so you spell it by writing module semicolon. And then following that, you can have any sequence of preprocessor defines. So define or include or anything like that, preprocessor directives, sorry. Any sequence of preprocessor directives, and then followed by your, your module declaration. You cannot write anything other than preprocessor directives in this module fragment. And everything in that fragment gets put into what's called the global module. And this allows you to use a non-modular header without taking ownership of uh, its declarations. So generally speaking, you're not going to want to include headers into the body of your module or what, what, what's called the module purview, so everything below the module with declaration. Um, because most headers are not designed for that. Unless you intend to take ownership of 
everything in that header, don't do that. So, we're going to skip past that one. Um, okay, so this is what the, the, the structure of a module looks like with the module fragment. So you have the module fragment, which you can actually have, then you, and then if you have a module fragment, you can have some number of preprocessor directives, um, and then you have the module declaration. It is a little weird because like, you can write, you can put an include in the global fragment that includes a header that has you know, like a declaration of a type, but you can't put a declaration of a type itself into the module fragment. I will, I will admit it's a little bit odd. All right, so modules are order independent. So import A followed by import B is equivalent to import B followed by import A. Because they're sandbox encapsulated, like, like the, the ordering is completely, doesn't matter. And this, is, this one is, um, I think, one of the, the parts of modules that, that is going to be the trickiest for us to adapt to, which is modules cannot have cycles. So if you have, we looked at this example before of uh, two headers that had a cyclic dependency. Um, you cannot do this in modules. You cannot, you, in fact, you can't have forward declarations in modules unless you define the thing later in the module because modules own their declarations. So if I try to port this, um, the, the, these two headers, two modules, and try to put those forward declarations in there, I'm going to have two problems. One, I'm, I'm trying to create a, a, a cyclic import chain here. You're not allowed to do that. You'll get a compiler error for this. So with, with headers, if you include two headers cyclically, you won't get a compiler error. With modules, you will. It will tell you, you can't do this like you have a cycle. No. But also, the forward declaration of y and x won't work here because modules are sandboxed, so they won't ever see the definition from the other module unless they import it. Yes? Um, if you introduce the same name, um, so if you introduce the same name in two different modules, then you're going to get an error because modules own their declarations. And so if you introduce something like, like the example I'm thinking of is like if you're introducing different partial specializations of a template, um, I believe those are order independent too. Um, in like ADL candidates, those should be order independent too. All right, so can't do this. Um, yeah, we already explained. If you, even if you take out the import, you can't do this because modules are encapsulated, so your attempt to forward declare things doesn't work. All right, so you have to break your cycles to modularize your code. Um, this is something that you probably should have done already because cyclic dependencies are not good, but we all have them in our codes even though we know that they're not good. Um, so suppose we have like two headers, like x and y, um, and they have some entities in them. Like x has some entity a that depends on some entity in some other header, b, and then b is in this other header, and it also depends on a. But then I have other entities in these headers that depend on a and b. The, the really the best strategy here is you need to take this cycle and encapsulate it into a new unit. So you add a new module for A and B, you, you take, and then you have everything in C and D, um, like stay there, that's not cyclic, and then C depends on, on this new module, or sorry, X depends on this new module, and Y depends on this new module. So this, this requires structural code change. If you have cycles in your, in your headers and you want to turn them into modules, it will probably require structural code change. Okay, so as I mentioned before, modules own their declarations. So if I've got, um, uh, right here, this example where I've got, I've got a, a module implementation unit and an interface unit on the right here that defines this function foo. And then I have this function b that imports um, uh, a. So it imports a. It just sees the declaration on the right there. It just sees the declaration of void foo in the module interface unit. It doesn't see the definition. And then it attempts to define its own definition of foo as a static in b.cpp. You can't do this because the module A owns the name foo because it declared the name foo. So nobody, like, 
B doesn't see immediately the definition, but because the name was declared by module A, it cannot define it because it does not own it. OK, so this is just some text that says what I said. Um, and if this, if this happens, if this is not detectable, so, so if you do this across multiple translation units, you'll get the same sort of ill-formed NDR that you get today. Um, where, where if it's not observable within the translation unit that you violated this rule, then the compiler can't you know, tell you that you violated it. But it's still in DR. Um, so note that using declarations, typed up declarations, and alias declarations do not declare entities, but merely introduce names. So it's fine to, uh, like those are not owned by modules, and it's fine to have those repeat. Um, yeah, that's the same. Stuff. Okay, so modules uh, can be contained within one file. So let's say that I've got some like pimple class um, that where I want to put just the declaration of the struct um, in the header unit, and then I want to define it in in the uh, the body, like in the in the CPP file itself, um, or something like this, where like I want to declare something in a header or a module interface unit, and then define it in the in the body in the module implementation unit. You can actually do this in one file with modules using what's called the private module fragment. So this module colon private thing, anything after that is part of the private module fragment. And things in the private module fragment are neither visible nor reachable when you import the module. So it is as if everything below the module private was in its own separate um, module implementation file. But it's a convenient way to allow you to write this in a single file. So th this is a now this is not the final form of the module unit structure. But now now here's what it looks like. You can have the module global fragment, which starts with module, followed by a semicolon, then some number of includes and defines, then your module declaration, followed by your imports, followed by the body of your module interface unit. Then you optionally can have a module private fragment, and then the stuff in the module private fragment. So this is the structure of module units. I see a hand there. Is there a public equivalent? Um, no. Feel free to write a paper. Um, yeah, there. Um, well, if you don't export the, if you don't export the declaration. Then nobody else has has use of that name. Sure, you could use it inside the module. But if I want to export, if I want to export a declaration of a type, like an incomplete, if I want to export an incomplete type, I need to I need to export it explicitly. All right, one more question. Yeah. Um, uh, yes, I think, I think what modules um, does, and the next thing that we get to, we'll, we'll expand on this. Modules gives us greater freedom in how we structure our source code, where we don't need to necessarily put things into separate files for one reason, um, or, and we don't need to arbitrarily put everything into one file, too. So th this, this, this allows you to, to, um, to write an, inter an interface and an implementation in a single file. The next thing I'm about to show you lets you write an, uh, uh, an interface and an implementation across multiple files and still write a single module. All right, well, let's go there. Modules can be split across multiple files. This is probably the most advanced module subject. Um, they are called module partitions. Um, so I showed you this example earlier where I had a square module and an add module and then I had a math module that re-exported square and add. Instead of doing this, I can use module partitions. So module partitions are denoted with the, uh, the colon here. So instead of having a module square in this square.ixx, I have export module math colon square. And then in the add.ixx, I have export module math colon add. And then in math.ixx, I export import colon add and colon square, which exports and imports the 
the module partition. Only the primary interface unit for a module can export or import the partition. So I can't go into my code outside of this module and import um, math colon square. It's just within the module partition itself that I can export and import things. All right, more advanced example. So, sorry, did somebody have a question? Yeah, go. Sorry, and it, if, can you, I'm not sure I understand. Where is not exported from math? Um, yes. Things that are not exported from a partition, when you import a partition or a partition into another part of the module, you can use anything in that partition even if it's not exported. The reason that I'm exporting here in the, the, the square partition is because I want square to be part of the final interface of the module. Yes. Um, so like outside of the module, you mean? No, no. Can you import just part of the partition outside of the module? And then the answer is no. You cannot do that. Yeah. Which file do you distribute? Um, you distribute all of the interface files. Uh, no, do not distribute compiled module interfaces. Um, uh, yes. You, you, the compiled module implementation or your .o files that will get turned into your .so or your .a, you do need to distribute those, yes. Yeah, question in the back? We're gonna get there. Um, it has nothing to do with files. We're gonna get there. All right, um, let's go on to this other example of module partitions. So first I've got this math underbar vector.ixx. This is the primary module interface unit. There must be at least one primary module interface unit for each partition. It's the primary because it doesn't have a colon in its export, so it exports module named math.vector. It's not, it does not export in a partition. It imports some partition called dot product, which is here. And in dot product, um, we import some other partition and we import span. And we, we export something from the dot product partition. But then from this other partition that we have here, we have this sum of squares function. We don't export this. And then finally, we have an implementation unit where we um, uh, provide a definition of our square root function. So it's not important to understand the exact specifics of this example. The point is just that this gives you a lot of flexibility in how you structure your modules. All right. I think this is the final form of this chart. So there are six types of translation units in C++ 20, which is five more than you had to think about in C++ 17. We have non-modular units, which is sort of the traditional source files. We have header units, which are synthesized by header imports. We have module interface units, which are sort of analogous to headers. We have module implementation units, which are sort of analogous to, to traditional source files. We have module partition interface units, which are parts of a module, of a module, and we have module partition implementation units, which are also parts of a module. Anybody have any questions on this chart? Okay, good. All right, so modules do not force a file in on you. All right, so as I said earlier, I am the chair of ISO IEC JTC1 SC22 slash WG21 study group 15, which is the tooling study group uh, that study group is primarily concerned with figuring out what exactly modules are going to do to the C++ ecosystem, to tools, to projects, build systems, IDEs, static analysis tools, etc. So the first and most fun question, in my opinion, is the module lookup question. So ask yourself, how exactly are headers found? You might think that this is something that the standard like, defines. It's not. It's not. There's no, nothing in the standard that says that including math.hpp has to find a file called math.hpp and like, use that as the header. It could go and find a file called foo 
.hpp and decide like that could be its lookup rule, that whatever you include anything, I'm going to look for a file called foo. In practice, all implementations assume a mapping between file names and includes, and the file is searched for in a set of include paths. And this is a very easy search because you don't have to search every file. You just have to look for a file that has that name. So you've got like a set of directories. You look through all those directories for a file that has the name map.hpp. Easy, simple, you're done. Um, so here's an example of, of, of a different way of dealing with includes. This is something that Godbolt does where you can include a URL in Godbolt. So this is, this is perfectly fine. This is legal C++. Perfectly legal C++ that this include, like, basically does wget and goes and grabs that header from somewhere. That's fine. OK, so how are modules found? Also not specified by the standard. There's one big distinction. Modules are programmatically named. This header here, math.hpp, math nowhere in math.hpp does it say that it is math.hpp. The file name is the identity, which makes it easy. Modules are explicitly named. So I could have a file bar.ixx, which exports a module foo. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say, don't do this. This is not going to be best practice. Um, now, this gets more complicated once you have dots in the names and once you have partitions, because you probably don't want to have a file that's called like math dot vector colon, you know, uh, dot product. That's not a pleasant file name to deal with. I'm sure some operating systems will be very unhappy with that. Um, but with, with modules, a file name to module name mapping is not straightforward. And part of the reason for this is because modules have to be pre-compiled. Pre and also partitions really, really complicate this. So, when you pre-compile a module into a CMI, um, you are compiling it with a, in a particular environment with a certain set of options. And those options and the global macro defin definitions that you have, those define like the ABI of that CMI. Down to like things like the warning flags. Like if you compile a, your, if you pre-compile your uh, a module interface with certain warning flags, and then the consumer of that module interface uses different warning flags, you're going to have a bad time. So every compiler is going to make that not work. And this is why you should not distribute CMIs. Because if you distribute CMIs, you are telling your users, you have to use exactly the same configurations as I do, the same exact build flags, the same exact compiler down to like the build number the same warning flags. You do not want to do that. You want to distribute module interface units and allow your users to pre-compile them to CMIs themselves. This also means that module lookup isn't just a matter of mapping a module name to a particular CMI. You really have to map a module name plus the CMI configuration, or like a hash of it, to a module interface unit plus a CMI. So there's a few different strategies here. Um, the, the one that to many people seems most sensible is to assume that the file name equals the module name and search in some set of directories. Um, so like when importing foo, you look for foo.ixx and foo.cmi in a set of search directories. And if you find a foo.cmi that has the wrong CMI configuration, you give an error or you build one on the fly. I suspect most compilers will implement some mode of this. Um, as a way of like getting started with modules, but our deployment experience, so GC GCC did this in their initial experience, and they got feedback from their, their alpha users that this was too restrictive, that they needed something more powerful than a, a simple lookup like what, what we have for headers. Um, some other options, you could just do a search, so you could just say, hey, look in all of these, look in all these search directories for any file with a .ixx extension and check every one of them to see if it exports a module with this name. That's going to be very slow. Um, I don't believe that anybody is planning on doing this. Um, there is the option of explicitly passing in the CMIs and uh, potentially the module interface units. This is basically what Clang does today, um, or it's one of the options that is supported by Clang. This is, I think, one of the better approaches where you need to like explicitly tell the compiler, here are all of the inputs to building this thing. Um, there's also like an option of having an explicit static mapping, similar to Clang style module maps today. Um, I, I suspect that we'll end up with something like this in Clang as well. 
And then there's an option of having something like a client server daemon where your compiler talks to the daemon and requests like, hey, I need this module. It's like, I, I want this module with this name. Tell me where the CMI is. Or, hey, I just built this CMI with this name. Like, register it with you. Um, there's, this is one of the approaches that the GCC team is exploring. They have a, a uh, experimental version of this working and integrated with make. Um, it's a little complicated. It basically required actual changes to make to make this work. Um, but so this is one of the approaches they are investigating. Um, implicit pre-compilation, which is, I think, what most people are going to want out of the box, is a bit problematic. So if you, if you need to, if you're going to assume that, like, your build system or your compiler needs to implicitly figure out like this, the, dependent, the module dependencies, and then figure out in what order to build the CMIs, that's a very difficult problem. Um, like in this case we saw earlier, we've got like, you know, three, interface, inter three interfaces used by like seven different files. Um, if the pre-compilation is implicit here, like it's kind of tricky for the build system and the compiler to figure out who's going to build the CMI, right? Like either this requires deep build system support or it requires deep compiler support. Um, CMake is going this route um, where they, they do this impl implicit uh, pre-compilation um, because they think that that's going to be the easiest thing for their users. But it's, it's not an easy thing to do. And if you have your own in-house custom build system, it, it will require some work to make this happen. So um, for this to work, you have to assume that the existence of a fast dependency scanner, and those do exist. They are being built. Clang has a fast dependency scanner. And that fast dependency scanner, like you run it over your code base and it figures out what CMIs need to be built. This comes with the cost of having to do a, a scanning pass prior to compilation. So you have to scan through your project, discover the dependencies. Then you have to go and build the CMIs. Then you do your compilation. Um, so explicit pre-compilation, I think, is ideal, but uh, it's more complicated. Um, I will admit it is more complicated. However, I think it will, it will benefit us to explicitly encode these dependencies. The best analogy I can give you is this. In your projects today, you're like building your object files in your libraries. You do that explicitly. You explicitly state in your build system, I'm going to construct this library or this executable from this set of input files. If, if, you, like, if you're asking for implicit pre-compilation of module interfaces, it's like you're asking your build system, hey, I'm just going to define all these source files, and then I want you to figure out what executables and what libraries I should make from that. Like, that's a hard problem to put on your build system. I think, it, I think it's on us to, to, to describe the dependencies of the build to the build system. All right, so um, tools are, are really no longer going to be able to, to rely on simple lookup mechanisms in the future to understand C++ projects. This is really already true. If you have a, if you have a, um, a, C, a tool that doesn't deeply integrate with a, with a compiler, you're going to have problems today. But, but dependency scanning now requires a C++ pro, uh, parser, not just a preprocessor. Um, so it's a little bit harder than it used to be. So tools that want to understand C++ code need to interface with a compiler. You're not going to be able to get away with your own in-house parser going forward unless it's like a full C++ parser. And if you want to be able to consume um, compiled module interfaces, um, which you probably do because it will make your tool a lot faster. Like if you if you have like a code completion tool, like using the, the pre-compiled module interface for doing code completion is going to be way faster than you parsing the source files yourself. But to do that, you're going to have to interface with the compiler because the compiler is the only one that understands that the, the, the format of that compiled module interface. So it's going to have a cost, but there's going to be a big benefit for tools to learn or to interface with compilers. Um, so uh, I know that a lot of this stuff seems like it's going to be hard or difficult or going to have a big impact, and we are aware of that on the committee. That is why we are putting together a C++ ecosystem technical report. We haven't published a technical report in many years, but Herb likes to describe technical reports as they're, like, uh, they're more like essays than specification. So it's, it's going to be a document that will describe um, best practices for modules based on deployment experience with build systems and with various different compilers. We'll probably describe some different 
um, file formats, like there's a for file format for dependency metadata that the CMake um, people have came up with. That'll probably be in the technical report. We may describe some file formats for things like module mapping, or we may describe some protocols for module mapping in this technical report. Um, I can't give you a date on when we're going to put this out. My guess is going to be that it'll probably come out in 2021, 2022. Um, our goal is to have this be really driven by deployment experience and to set out, you know, best practices for uh, uh, everyone who's going to need to deal with modules. <laughs> My guess is that it's going to take us 10 to 15 years to really truly adopt modules across the industry because it will have a big impact. Um, but like, it, 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 the transition's not free, but if we make the transition, modules offer substantial algorithmic build throughput improvements. So Google uses a form of modules in-house. It's not, not what's in the standard. They use a more implicit form that they spent many years rolling out. And the reason they did that is because they were getting killed by build times and modules was the thing that saved them. Like it, was, it had a big cost for them, but it was the one thing they could do to substantially reduce their build times. So, Modules also offer us a lot of benefits from the true encapsulation and the sandboxing that we get with them, but it means that we're going to have to start to move away from macros. Like, like that's a good thing long term, but it is going to be painful. Like, I love macros. I may be the only person on the committee who really loves macros. They're taking my macros away from me, but I understand why it needs to happen. Because macros are not clean, and they, 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 complicate, um, they complicate the language. So moving us away from them is a good thing. Um, I want to thank these people, uh, Hannah, who provided me with a diagram and moral support, uh, Richard Smith, who I sent like 20 emails this week uh, because modules are complicated and I need to understand how they work, Michael Spencer, likewise, he also reviewed my slides, and Gasper made some suggestions for some of my slides. That is my talk. I will now take some questions. Yes, in the back. Sorry, you're going to have to yell a little louder. Yes. So the, that is, the compiler is only allowed to translate includes into imports for importable headers. And portable headers are currently, in the standard, specified as an implementation-defined set of headers. Um, that implementation-defined set currently consists purely of the standard library headers. For those standard library headers, the compiler can do something special because it, it distributes the standard library. So it can say, hey, I'm going to just have all my standard library um, uh, you know, uh, CMIs in this directory. And anytime somebody like compiles with me, I like if it's a new configuration, I'll put them in. Like I'll have some new naming scheme for them, or I'll hash or something. So so the compiler can take care of that. Then for I suspect most compilers will have some mechanism where you can like opt in to a certain header being importable, um, and they'll probably they'll probably either have some caching mechanism like I described, or the burden will be on you. But it's not like you're including your headers out of the box without like doing anything, like headers that you own, is not going to magically be turned into imports in C++20. It's just going to happen for C++ standard library headers. And that's probably a good thing. That's probably going to be a performance win for us. And the back. Um, are they going to have a specific standard? No. Everybody's going to do their own different thing. Um, but we're going to have this C++ ecosystem technical report. And I promise to make all of the compiler vendors describe how their CMIs, like, like the, the nature of their CMI format in this technical report. Why, why, why do you want to try and standardize that? Um, because of implementation freedom. This is like asking, this is like a well, question we frequently get about, like, why don't we have a standardized ABI? Because if we had a standardized ABI, then C++ wouldn't be as portable as it is. We want to preserve implementation freedom. We already know that um, th the three major vendors want to do very different things for their CMI format. And there's very different ownership models for their CMI format. And in fact, questions is, is, as simple as, is the module part of the mangled name of a type, which 
like gets to the question of like, can you move it between modules? The answer may be different for different platforms. It's just because of different, different decisions that the different vendors have made about what they think is best for their platform. And we don't want to take that freedom away from them. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, because I might want to have something, like, I, I might want to have stuff that's in my interface unit that's not uh, uh, publicly exposed. Like, I might want to have, uh, what? Yeah, just so that the interface can use it, yeah. Or, or so I had an example that I took out of my slides, um, which I can now go back to. You, there are certain um, interface designs where you want to have an unutterable type. Um, like right here, okay, Doo -doo -doo. let me unhide these. Um, so, like std bind, std binds return type in the standard is unspecified. There's no need for you to ever need to spell out what the type of std bind is. But like, if you go and dig around in your standard library, you can go and find the name of the type and you can go and construct like it yourself if you want to. But you really shouldn't do that, and like you shouldn't be able to do that. So with modules now, you can you can have an unutterable type. Like if you include or if you import this module, you can't actually spell out the name underbar underbar binder because it's not exported. Now bind is an exported function, and it returns a type you know an instance of this type, and you can use that, but you can't spell out the type. I mean, you can decal type to get to it, but if you're doing that, you already know what you're doing, and you know what you get. All right, there. Um, is there a long-term plan to get rid of defines and C-style headers? There are members of the committee who have long-term plans to eliminate all macros from the language, so that would necessarily be part of that. Uh, there. Um, okay, the question was, can I repeat how you can get ill-formed NDR with different entities and different modules? If you have two entities, hang on, uh, I'm not gonna try to search around for the rule. Okay, we'll see if we can get there. Um, basically, if two modules both, if you have two entities that have external linkage, two names that have external linkage, that are, that are or, or if you have something that, that eh, if you have two declarations of the same name with external linkage in two different modules, there you have, there you have um, uh, ill-formed NDR. And if you have two reachable declarations of the same name with external linkage, um, uh, then you have, uh, uh, then it's ill-formed, but because they're reachable, you can diagnose it. So if one of the two names is not have external linkage, you're fine. Um, but if they both have external linkage, so if they're both exported, then you have a problem. Alrighty, we're going to take like one or two more, then I'm going to let these people go. Yes. Um, so, what uh, you have. Yeah, that, that should be fine. Uh, well, I take that back. Um, there's two different ownership models for modules. There's the weak ownership module where the module name is not part of the types in the module, so it's not part of the mangled name, it's not part of the ABI. And then there's the strong ownership module where the module name is part of, it's, it's part of the mangled name of the things in that module. With the strong ownership module, you wouldn't be able to like take your old static um, uh, archive and write a module interface unit for it. Um, now, what you could do is you could just continue including the headers to it as you always did, or you could, um, uh, or if you have a compiler that has the weak ownership model, then you could write a module interface unit for it, um, or you could rely on legacy imports. But like, you're, you're still able to include stuff in like the old traditional way um, in C20. That's not going away. Is the, sorry, is the what? 
Um, right. So for, for, um, for GCC and Clang and for their uh, corresponding standard libraries, um, both care very deeply about ABI and um, are, have no interest in taking an ABI break in C++20. So std vector in C++20, I feel pretty confident in saying that it's going to be ABI compatible with std vector in C++17 and GCC and Clang. Yes. Yes, I yes. So, in a sense, you said the uh, distributed, the binary of the compiled implementation of Mobile, Mobile implementation. And so, you mean to say that you still have to uh, distribute the debugging the read mode? Um, well, well, okay, so, so to clarify, do not distribute the pre compiled artifacts. Like, the one takeaway from my talk should be don't do that. So, so yeah. But yeah. Yes, yes, and yes, you, you will, if the, yeah, you will still need debug builds, you will still need release builds, yes. And maybe other stuff, because it's the same, the same Ex problem. It's, it's, yes, exactly, it's the same problem, yes. But the, 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 the difference is um, the, the, the CMIs, that format, is way, way, way less stable than the format of your object files. So like, if the CMI for most compilers is basically just a dump of its AST, and the compiler AST changes like every 10 commits. Um, whereas like the layout, uh, uh, like the, the, com the compiler's layout of, of, uh, of object files is pretty stable because you'd expect it to be. I'm talking about how uh, uh, Yeah. Yes. Yeah, right. So, so yes, you, you still have that problem there. Modules do not solve that. Yes. Last question. Um, modules are basically standardized precompiled headers. Um, I, I, I don't know that I can, not necessarily, um, because like, Precompiled headers are a feature that is not, it wasn't written to the spec. But like, modules are a standardized version of precompiled headers. I would expect the performance to be similar. Adi tells me there's, ah, closing words from Michael. It's time for me to